<laughs> Three, two, one, and we are live. Hello, guys. It's Rob Rangi. I hope you're doing very well. Today is chapter two of my conversations with Marcus about uh, education and mental health, um, the mental health of the students and, and the teachers. Marcus, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, as always, yeah, I'm good. How are you? You're always very well. What's your secret? Um, I've, I've set myself up for a fall in the first sentence there, haven't I? That's <laughs> um, no, I'm, 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 I'm nice and level, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Do you have any advice? So, this is a mental health channel. So everyone who's watching, or a lot of people who are watching, are probably struggling with maintaining that balance. Do you mm -hmm. have any tips on how to stay um, how to stay level across time? Uh, well, I mean that's it. I mean, you know, as always, and analysing your own outlook on things is difficult. But I, I think I, probably if I was to take myself out of myself for a moment and say, I don't really linger too long on on anything and I'm very conscious about lingering on something um, and um, and, I, and I, tr I try and see a balance in things and try and see both sides of things and I suppose what ends up happening then is maybe you cut out some of those really high highs but um, yeah. but you don't have those low lows either so um, well, it's, it's great you've got the ability to kind of monitor that even to some extent Anyway, we're already drifting off topic, which is quite impressive. So, <laughs> yes, we, the other day, yesterday, let's, yeah, let's be honest about it. There's no mystery here. Yesterday, uh, we talked about curriculum teaching versus non-curriculum teaching and the realities of both, uh, or the lack of reality maybe in the latter, which you were, as you were laying out, because uh, it might turn into the Lord of the Fly situation. We talked about how the, I asked you if there was enforced water drinking at your school. Uh, secondary school you work at, not not go to. Um, you said there wasn't, which you know I've got I've got a chip on my shoulder about. And <laughs> the Skype was playing all kinds of horrible tricks on us, all kinds of all kinds of pranks, making us sort of do this as we talked. It's probably going to do it a bit now, but it's it's, it's nowhere near as bad. Um, so let's talk about some positive stuff. What do you think? What do you find the most fulfilling thing about teaching? What ages do you teach and what are the most fulfilling things about teaching young people to you? I think, uh, well, from a teacher point, first of all, I, I teach ages 11 through to 16 and all uh, prior attainment levels. Some people might say ability levels. Um, uh, and and often actually some of the, the the children will ask you, especially the ones that don't really enjoy my particular subject. How is it that you can do five lessons of this in a row every day? Because they can't get their head around that. And uh, I think it's a bit of a hackneyed old cliched thing, but I I think um, the variety, uh, the fact that the the kids are so different every day, even the same kids from one day to another. And of course, the the idea that if you believe that it's worth the kids knowing what it is that you're teaching them, that when you see them make a breakthrough, even at a really, really basic level, potentially, or at a really high level, um, that, that you had some sort of hand in that. And I think naturally as a teacher, you end up, uh, you're encouraged all the way through your training, et cetera, to constantly appraise your own performance. And, that can actually lead to a kind of uh, a sort of negative spiral for some people. But but certainly when you look at a, a kid doing something in a particular way and you think that's got my idiosyncrasies in it, it they I, I can see directly that they got that from me. Whereas actually the sort of negative voice as a teacher might tell you, um, oh, whatever they're doing well, they picked up somewhere else along the way. But sometimes there is the, the hallmark or the fingerprint of, of something that you've taught them. And I think that's, that's really great. That feels good. But you've got to obviously, like I say, you, you've got to believe that what you're actually teaching them is worthwhile for them to know. Otherwise, that, that wouldn't have any kind of value, really. Yeah. You said the word encouragement. Um, I, I think, in my experience, 
just to really clarify, sort of eight, eight years, um, six years peripatetic teacher, not full time, but like three or four hours a day, every day, term time, and then full time teacher for two years. Um, I found that the most fulfillment I got was, was for encouraging them. And I, I developed the philosophy that the peak virtue is patience, because <laughs> without that, you're not going anywhere. And then encouragement um, beneath that, um, because they, often they haven't heard it, or they've, or they've heard the opposite, I've seen, especially in the further east you went in London. Some really horrible things going on, you know, um, hopefully rarer than uh, we'd like to think. But um, anyway, do you find that? side of it as fulfilling as, as I did because that, that was really was it for me so it's watch, watching the effects and the eyes light up of, of you saying just the right thing or you think you have to um to push them in the right in the direction they needed to go that day on that subject at that minute you know with that in that weather even if you get you develop a really finely tuned instinct for it yes you on the encouragement Yes, definitely. I, I think if you're looking at it from that academic growth side of things, then, like I say, if, if you see them um, build and that and that can be spread over a period of time as well, especially if you if you teach in uh, students who have struggled with your subject before, uh, it yeah. can take a long time and and um, and it can be really um, heartwarming to be sort of gooey about it. But it can be really heartwarming to see them change over, say, three months. Uh, whereas if you ask them, have you got any better? They would probably say, uh, no, I'm, I've, I've always been uh, really uh, lacking in confidence in this particular subject. And I still am. And you sort of think, yeah, but. You know, deep down, I can see that actually you've made big strides. But I think also from the personal point of view as well, from that pastoral point of view of 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 setting the kid in the right direction. Um, you know, I'm quite a quite emotionally attuned person, I'd like to think. And and I still have to kind of stop myself feeling a little emotionally um, overwrought almost even in those very, very small moments where you make a difference and you you give that uh, child that, that, that human, you know, experience that they've, you know, felt maybe, maybe, not, maybe lacked throughout the day, maybe they've been disciplined or maybe they've, you know, been shouted at by their parents or whatever in the morning or they've had a couple of bad lessons that day and just having that, little one-to-one -one moment with them where you take them out of that zone and and build a little positive bond with them again is that always feels really great as well and and i have to stop myself sort of experiencing it as it's happening you know because otherwise you you, you don't stay focused in that putting that kid back on the right track kind of thing and i can't pretend to be really brilliant at that or anything but um you know certainly that it, it's it's quite easy to um if you want to use a, a really harsh sounding term, sort of psychologically manipulate them back to back to something more positive. Um, yeah, if, yeah, if you're looking at it without any truth filters, uh, the naked truth is still taboo wherever it can be seen, as Bob Dylan put it. Yeah, you've been manipulating them back to feeling good. You know? um, it's quite easy, it's, well, it gets easier and easier the younger they get maybe um, to, to do that. <laughs> Because they, they can't lie, really, when they're eight or nine or ten, or, or they're bad at lying. They'll, you know, adults might lie and go, like, um, little scratch of the nose. Like, oh, the, most kids, eight or nine, they'll lie and they'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> and there's, yeah, they're, they're brilliant. They're brilliant for that. Um, so I, the most exciting thing for me about the encouragement and the fulfillment and the good you can do is thinking about all the stuff you don't even realize that you've done. <laughs> do you know what I mean? The, 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 the right kind comment or the right um, compliment of their new trainers or whatever it is. It, it might be different in, um, I have worked at secondary schools, but only for like 1% of my thing because it was just, again, this is East London, but I know they're hard, very hard everywhere. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't, couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't hack it. Um, I remember once doing some volunteer work, um, teaching 
teaching kids to read in, in the mornings. And this little Indian girl, she was about six, um, I think she's Indian, came and sat and we did like 10 minutes, 10 minutes reading. I was like, oh, can you tell me what happened in the last two pages? Uh, what do you think of that? What's your favorite word in this? What words are you in? So blah, blah, blah. Was, and she seemed a bit shy, but re- felt fairly normal. And then she walked off. And one of the other teachers came up to me, like almost straight away, and was like, oh, that was so nice to see her interacting with a, a male like that because her dad um, rapes her mum and makes her watch. Or did you do? And you just, you did, <laughs> I was just blown away by it, thinking, A, how horrible it is, and B, how much good I might have inadvertently done to change her view of men, maybe, you know, like for life. Uh, not, yeah, like, not to be too, not to be too self-flattering, but I'm an improvement on him. That's for sure. Um, do you ever look at it like that, like this, like the the wonderful ocean of stuff you, good stuff you've done or said that you don't know about for the, for the mental health of the of the of the students? I think uh, I think absolutely. I think that's massive. I think um, the faster you can relax into a persona as a adult professional and the faster you can get on with just having those normal interactions where your yes. true personality shines through um well obviously you're interacting with young people and you're going to be and in a professional context you're going to be different to to how you or i might be together as friends um but the faster that you can allow your true self to guide those interactions the more you can actually create a, a, a positive role model providing you are a positive person i truly believe that you know people really are i i think also what you were saying there really made me think about a much broader thing about the mental health of young people about the mental health of uh, of teachers about the mental health of people in general is that um you mentioned all the thousands of of tiny interactions and 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 little things which we as individuals would take for granted Um, and you know naturally we don't sort of think to blow our own trumpet and in some ways there's 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 nothing particularly impressive about saying good morning to somebody and asking genuinely how they are and then responding to that but one of the things that really struck me after about um, two or three years of going through uh, teachers, we call it quality assurance, where you're appraised by other teachers to make sure that you're doing the right things, is that one of my mentors sat down with me. And and like I mentioned before, when you're going through teacher training, you're encouraged to constantly appraise your performance positively or constructively. But inevitably, that leads to those nagging voices and doubts and things also building up a lot because that's part of your process. And this mentor yeah. sat down with me and, and said, right, okay, so we've ticked off all of those sort of big things. And I'd been quite savvy, I thought, and I'd written down things that I'd done during the year. You know, I volunteered with this sports team or whatever to make sure that I had like a list of, of big hitter things that I could say, yeah, you know, I've, I've justified my uh, p- being part of this stuff. And the mentor said, yeah, but what about all, all the other stuff and and then she proceeded to list all these things, which I would just say, I would never tell anybody else that I do that because surely it's obvious that I do yeah. that, you know. And and actually, these are the things that we as, as, as professionals, but probably the children as well and people in general often struggle with is, is actually recognizing and realizing all the great little things that make you you. And that, and that the big nagging voices would 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 want to diminish and make really small and say, now that they've yeah. got, you know, they're, 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 everybody's doing them, they almost don't count. And actually, you know, that's the things that we need to p- pat ourselves on the back for. And it was a revelation that that somebody else patted me on the back for things that I would just say, uh, it's 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 one oh one, you know, it's being a human one oh one. It's so obvious and so easy, but. But yeah, and I think actually, you know, as as mentors and role models, that's something that we can offer the kids as well is is just like, don't forget to to realize, you know, the great little things that you're going to take for granted and that you, your negative voices are going to are going to diminish. What do you what do you think about about that? Do you do you think you sort of praise yourself internally enough or? 
Oh, Jesus, no. No. It's not a natural thing, is it? It's not natural. It doesn't come natural. I don't think maybe, maybe everyone is. So it did tempt, depends on your temperament, but I'm, I'm just... It's my discursive thinking mind or ego or whatever it is that's constantly on play and my attention seems so easily captivated by. Um, it doesn't have good intentions towards me. It's, <laughs> it's full of bad ideas. Uh, it's extremely critical. It, um, it allows me to justify pathologies more and problems more um, as well. But that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a little, that's a little side note. Um, it's more the, feel, the feeling of the, of the fulfillment when you see it in action kind of thing. And there's a, there's a sweetness to the memory of it, but there's uh, a Leonard Cohen line, um, I thought the past would last me, but the darkness got that too. <laughs> um, yeah, a sweet peak of a memory. But um, no, I'm very much more, when it comes to my own mind, it's, t it's, it's telling me much, much more things I did wrong or things I need to improve on or things I'm doing inadequately at the, at the minute. So, uh, do you think, well, um, sorry, go on. No, that was it. I was going to say, do you, do you think it's, I mean, I can't pretend for a second to be expert in any sort of psychology, but do you think it's, uh, um, that's what the channel is all about, pretending to be an expert in um, mental health. <laughs> Uh, well let's let's ask some pretend expert questions then so do you All think right. it, do you think it's healthy to try and fight back against those um louder negative voices is that what somebody would call kind of um compartmentalizing it or like like hiding it away and storing it up for I problems think later? fighting it is what I, fighting it is what i do but I think that approach is like taking a baseball bat and hitting a hornet's nest. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. One of the first things any meditation teacher will tell you is um, allowing things to be. Is that you feel you know, you're like focusing on feeling things more, not trying to suppress them. Again, I'm a total hypocrite. Less and less so because I've got a legitimate weaning prescription from certain medication that I was using to treat derealization for five years. Um, so it's not suppression it's then. It's 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 uh, i was gonna say managing but are you almost talking about emphasizing it but but being okay with that trying usually failing but slowly trying to become a witness of it instead of a hostage to it right i guess would be my thing um but just to bring us back to um earth uh, planet planet school yeah um, do you, kids confide it confide in you much or do you see a lot of pent up frustrations and angers and, and aggression uh, resentments and depressions and sadnesses or well oh, that's the question yeah <laughs> i think um i think first of all no i think um you know there's a there's a difficult relationship at the school at any school there's a pastoral element but students have to yes. know that uh, you know obviously they, 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 they can't take a teacher or staff member in confidence um because that's just not ethically professionally correct but i do think from yeah. an outside point of view looking in first of all a lot of your behaviours that you see, um, positive and negative, are about, you know, obviously a, a, an adolescent in that stage of life, finding their own way, making their own rules, finding the, their, their, the, what, the, what the rules are going to be and testing the limits within their friendship groups and, 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 yes. and, and, and becoming who they are, obviously. But I also think that there's um, probably a lot of repression in there and that's when you get your most sort of violent outbursts if you're looking at it from a negative behaviors point of view it, it is 
is that suddenly bubbling to the surface and and it will always be triggered by by something which is totally irrelevant and very small in comparison to what the what's really going on and i think the yeah. better i think the better educational uh, education professionals realize fairly early on that whilst the school has a framework and that you can't excuse things and that there are certain rules you you also take everything with the substantial pinch of salt that comes with realizing that there's there's, there's you know thousands of factors behind it but but yeah i i definitely think i i, I can't know what's going on in terms of oversharing or undersharing or anything else in terms of their own social networks especially you know something like social media because obviously i'm not party to that but i can imagine a scenario where there'd be quite a lot of social interaction through social media but ultimately um if a student is having a negative um a time of things mental health wise that that would be a, actually quite a lonely quite a lonely experience definitely okay and it just i guess especially for the boys because i'm it's you know, like young men in the, I guess, they're a bit older than school age, but say 30, um, leading cause of death is suicide, isn't it? 31, 32, 33, much more than, than girls. Although girls try more, but they're less brutal and <laughs> brutally effective at it, uh, thankfully. Um, do, you, yeah. do, you think, do you think that... Here's a question for you. Do you think that because of because of the shift in the zeitgeist and it be, it's being okay, it's become okay to talk about mental health issues and young people and old people and, and everyone, and they've become acknowledged to a lot of people at least as real conditions. PTSD is as real as asthma, you know, kind of thing. Um, do you think there's a a risk of getting lost in the reeds of conceptualizing all, all these just all these modes of being that are on a more fundamental level just ways of feeling the world but as soon as you um like i had an experience several years into the derealization which i can't really talk about but i realized after the day after that um conceptualizing the this how i'm feeling as one thing was one of the problems if not the main problem in the way of um recovering do you think do you think we're over egging the pudding with mental health I think that's a really interesting point um, and it comes down to and uh, yeah I possibly with mental health possibly with with lots of issues in general is I think it's I think it's done for the right reasons and I think um, it's it, it feels you, you can't tell but it feels like a positive step away from the norms of previous decades perhaps because yeah. that that's you know that's it's a very positive step to say you know let's open up let's talk about things let's but uh, within i think i think the worry is, is labels i think the worry is uh, self-fulfilling prophecies i think yes. Um, it, I think in one respect, it's it's really handy for a, a student to be able to to say um, in a same way that they might say, I, I'm epileptic. Please make sure that I've got my EpiPen. You will have students who are who, who are able to say, well, I've, I've been suffering with anxiety and depression for three years. You know, please take that into account. And I think that's that's positive that somebody is able to to know themselves in that way but obviously the worry as always is is balancing that against say pigeonholing and yeah the potential trap door of the words i've got depression yeah stop. yeah goes and back I, to what you were saying earlier about or what, something you said earlier about when when kids are really repressing something or suppressing something and all it takes is that the slight, the final straw on the camel's back, the slightest thing unrelated to their problems, even to to trigger it. Um, it feels like it's the same. It's the same in what you were just talking about. Um, and uh, do you think it's, it's it's given the cultural zeitgeist shift, if that's even a real thing? But it's, I'm going to stick with it. 
um, has produced a, a, a kind of natural um, depressurizing or a, a natural vent, let's say. Um, just, just to play devil's advocate on myself, in, in defense of all this mental health uh, talking, probably way healthier now in every metric than the Victorian area in England, you know? Like the mental health of young people. They're not up chimneys. <laughs> and they're not, you know, at least at least in this country, they're not, um, well, they're probably, we'll not talk about um, human trafficking. We'll save that for a, a more light comedic um, video. But um, do you know what I'm getting at? Am I making yeah. any sense at all? I think, I, I think, I think it w- some of the friction you then get with people who maybe don't understand that you possibly don't have that sort of um, training experience, emotional intelligence, or we're just not brought up with that is obviously then um, you might see um, the time. Uh, again, I, this is not something that I actually think, but sort of paraphrasing the time, the indulgence that is given to being able to think about these things is is maybe like sort of symptomatic of like a kind of cosseted society or something, a society where, you know, oh, and, and people, those sorts of people do make those comparisons back to, you know, in my day, it were, you know, there was no time for this because you just got on with things. And actually, yeah. I think a responsible thing to do is to, is to, is to perhaps sort of consider that in the full and, and always be wary of not just allowing a f- a life to flow a little bit as well and yeah. and just things to happen and and not to over analyze but i definitely do think yeah i think yeah we we've got to be in a in a better place you know, I think sometimes it's just an uncomfortable truth for people that now that we're able to put a name to something or we're able to describe things within a framework, then then it becomes maybe a little bit too real. You know, I imagine that the anxieties, the issues, the doubts, the self-doubts, the, the worries about the place within the world, all of these things which could affect young people, um, you know, were perhaps a little bit more black and white in 1850 because it was like you know very class based obviously and 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 class also meant access to the most basic resources um yeah. but but even if you were sort of in the 1960s or 1970s growing up then then the the worries about about fitting in about your own place about developing an identity and that in relation to society in general They'll have been exactly the same. I'm absolutely confident about that. And it's got to be good that we're just better able to put a name to some of these things. And and and, all, and also, you know, going to the more serious end of the spectrum, some of the illnesses that people will experience, which are more than just your standard hormonal worries, etc. So I think it can only be good that we've got greater knowledge it's just as always how do you balance that knowledge and awareness against just experience and just experiencing things and actually being able to 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 not overanalyze continuously yes or or to be able to change your relationship to that overanalysis um paralysis through analysis is a, is a hmm. great phrase hmm. um it's not one i've heard before it's good it's uh, I've got a cinematic street preachers B side called Dead Trees and Traffic Islands. Uh, they probably heard it somewhere and stuck it in because they were quite sloganeering, especially in the in the old days. But in a in a brilliant way. Yeah. Um, I'm an expert at going off topic with this. So there's so many things that I could ask you, and I, and you're probably starting to see for the um, pe- people watching are starting to see why I asked Marcus on in the first place. Um, I asked, I asked quite a lot of people on. Quite a lot of people said yes, and then followed it with a no. You know, I, <laughs> either a swift no afterwards, or they thought about it too much. They they obsessed the paralysis through analysis. And um, although to be fair to them, I was probably going to say to them, "Watch your inner life, like tell everyone." Um, 
this is a bit more <laughs> conceptual and um, less controversial and less anxiety provoking for me. It's nice to make a video that isn't um, that isn't really anxiety provoking. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. But my old landlord um, sent me a text when I sent him a I sent everyone a, a thing to the channel saying please subscribe, and he said, "Yeah, but you want to get people to watch, don't you?" <laughs> oh. um, and then he said, "Why don't you try? And, why don't you try interviewing some people?" Um, I thought that's actually a very really good idea. Yeah. Uh, I said, "People do watch and they like to and subscribe." Currently, I'm 640 or something. I know it's not; it's, it's tiny, but 60,000 views or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely hoping it to expand it into this more. I was going to say two-dimensional, but three-dimensional realm with conversation. You know, via a two-dimensional viewing point for me, device. It's a little bit, it's a little bit strange. Um, any reflections on any of that? Well, uh, yeah, definitely. It, I think it's amazing, really, because I would have a very sort of, um, in in terms of views of myself, I think you know, I I want something definitive. Um, to to experience myself you know something cultural it be you know a band or an album or whatever or read a book or whatever and i would never would have thought that i would have ever listened to people's conversations you know yeah, conversation like, rogan dwarfs cnn bbc you name it he dwarfs it and he yeah. gets high and has like four hour unplanned conversations with people <laughs> and that's the most popular thing on the planet yeah and i think it it's it's good it's good i do enjoy i do enjoy just listening to two people talk about something they might i, I think i think what's lovely it is when you listen to two people have a conversation through something like a podcast or a vlog or something like this uh and and they will admit faults yeah. Because if you if you listen to if you listen to two people have a conversation where it's almost a, in an essay based form, um, I mean like that's just to clarify, you mean essay writing or the sort of crude Mexican vibe essay. <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm yet I'm yet to tap into that particular line of podcast, but that's something which I yeah I might I might I might um I'm not even going to say anything culturally inappropriate at this point I'm not going to make any reference I'm going to keep myself clean there um but yeah no I, if you listen to two two people with like absolute confidence in their expertise have a conversation about a particular subject that can be really useful that can be really great but it can also be a little bit like reading a textbook and there's a time and a place kind of thing and 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 yeah i really do enjoy listening to podcasts i'm a big fan of adam boxton i don't know if you ever listened to his podcast where he no, just I talks, I, I'd, I'd recommend it yeah he just talks to somebody who he finds culturally interesting or it might be some a big name it might be a comedian it might be um but it will just ramble and it will go somewhere and it's just nice where it goes but what's lovely is when the interviewer or the interviewee just admits that they they don't know that much about something, but this is their impression of it. And I think that is as great to listen to as anything else, because it depends what you come into it for. But yeah, definitely. For me, it's, um, I, like it, I wish there was a, a better word, but it's, it's the vibe or the atmos of it. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you can tell when, when one person doesn't like the other or is being passive aggressive or they've both come in completely closed minded or yeah. again, going back to Joe Rogan, why is, so hugely popular and dominant um it's like a, it's a joyful it's just an amazing vibe in the in that in that do you know what i mean and they can have exactly the same conversation in terms of the words like you say in a, in a robotic essay like um you know writing essay in like way and it would and it would probably flop you know yeah but it's uh, it's it's the what is a better word than vibe vibe What's what's the atmosphere? I think the I think vibe is is totally fine. I think this vibe means that vibe is fine. So that's 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 okay. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um. Just don't read the comments ever. Okay. <laughs> Never go below the line. Is that the plan? <laughs> Never go below the line. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, one thing I wanted. To, uh, I forgot to say earlier. You um reminded me what so when i got my one death threat that i know of it was it was for a depression video 
and I got and they got talking to like five tips for depression, you know. Um, talking to this woman in subreddit, and I do find YouTube and Facebook civilized, more civilized than in subreddit comments in Reddit. And she was she sort of came after me. She was like, "How dare you talk like this? Like you don't know what you're talking about. You full of shit." Um, and I was sort of saying, oh, all I was saying was in the video was we all need to sort of grow some balls. And she's anonymous, like all these people are, who, who leave comments and, and say disobliging things to you. And, she, and I didn't know she was a woman. And she said, how dare you say to a woman, grow some balls, you disgusting misogynist, blah, 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 piece of shit. Like, you, um, you don't know about depression. You, 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 you're, out, you're out of the mental health community, she said. You're a traitor to the mental health community, which is the entire planet. So sorry about that. Guys. Yeah. Uh, and then That's said, you, better, you better watch your back you better watch your back and I can't remember if that was it but it was it was definitely enough to make me think oh I'm not reading subreddit shit anymore <laughs> which might sound a bit pathetic but um it's toxic but someone did point out to me my target audience are unstable people no offense to anyone watching but um <laughs> this is a mental health channel um Right. Right, Marcus. Right, that, before we, before we wrap on. this up, if you created your own school, what would the top three rules be to optimize the mental health of the young people? Oh my gosh! I put you on um, the spot. I'm going to fill this up while you talk to no one. Sorry. That's fine. Um, so my top three rules. I'm sorry to be a stickler for this one, but I, I do think they have a much um, more negative effect than positive effect. And I'm going to sound like such a fusty old fuddy-duddy, but I would, um, I, would, I would ban mobile phones. That's a hit phrase. You're hit. Um, oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Number one, ban mobile phones. I think that's... Completely ban mobile phones. Idea. Some schools I've worked at, they hand them in at the, uh, at the reception and get them back at the end of the day. Number two, I would I would completely remove written assessments. Um, I'm not sure how I'd replace that, the useful parts of what that does, but I'd completely yeah. remove those. And number three, I would I would have much greater choice in terms of pathways from an from an earlier point, and I would I would emphasise that the subjects were for the sake of those subjects rather than rather than for any sort of examination. Um, but I think the pastoral side. I would keep all of the pastoral things that schools currently have because I think they actually do a fantastic job from what I've seen um, in terms of the care and support for students just, in the classroom. Sorry, just um, just people from different countries or cultures. Can you unpack pastoral a little bit? What do you mean by that? Pastoral is pastoral is uh, literally it comes from a, a phrase referring to to a shepherd looking after a, a, a flock in in the in the fields. Hence pastoral. Which is to do with yeah. fields, um, but but literally it will be any sort of care or support that the school offers to a student outside of the classroom. So it would be anything to do with, with it would include mental health issues and things like that. But it, it could be it could be anything um, which is non academic really in terms of supporting young people. Okay, and if Boris Johnson put a gun to your head and said, "You have to make the children take one drug." every day or i'll kill you what what drug do you do you think would be most beneficial this is the first thing i'd say on that and, and the second thing would be feel free not to answer that given that uh, well i've already got my answer it's a cup of tea every morning that that would be it marcus is english in case you um <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, marcus is english yeah as am i marcus it was a pleasure to do chapter two of um of this conversation with you i hope you, you and uh, you and your good wife have a wonderful day and i hope you get back to um inspiring and encouraging the kids that i know i know you've got the drive and the persistence and the competence and the intelligence to do it so yeah go uh, onwards and upwards pleasure was all mine thank you rob all right man we'll have um an awkward five seconds to try and stop this and then we will go. All right, guys, if you like this, please please leave only saccharinely 
flattering compliments in the comments. Like it with the thumb thing, share it around to any teachers you know who you think are off the rails. And, and see you all later. Bye-bye.